Siegel, uh, screenwriter. Why don't you tell us about yourself? Yeah, I'm a writer and director. Um, I've been doing this for about 12 years or so. I've made five feature films, uh, two of them just as writer and then three as writer and director. Um, I did one earlier this year called Sargasso with Tom Berenger and Jeremy Sumter and Graham McTavish. And uh, about two years ago, I did one called When the Starlight Ends with uh, Sam Hewen and David Arquette and Sean Patrick Flannery and Arabella Oz. And my first film was uh, way back in 2007. I wrote and raised the money for that was with Aaron Paul. Well, you've also uh, written a couple of scripts for our company. I have. <laughs> yes, one um, is the martial art movie. Yep. Uh, that is to be set in Philippines mm -hmm. and uh, the other one is um, addressing social matter yeah the whole me too yeah it's one of my favorite scripts it's cry on command it's it's my first just ultra feminist script I love yeah, it it's I love fantastic. it yeah. I love it yeah. I love it I really love the fact that this inspiration by Theodore Dreiser mm -hmm. and this whole uh, social uh, the social structure effect affecting people's lives and essentially kind of like uh, crystallizing their so-called values. Mm -hmm. I think it's brilliant. I, yeah, I, I love it. And, I, you know, what attracted me to the idea was just I, I liked sort of exposing the hypocrisy of what actually happens in the film industry with regard to the sexual dynamic between men and women and where it's seen in a lot of ways as a very male-dominated industry which it is but i think women have an incredible amount of power and that men almost are a little bit afraid of that in some ways and that was actually what i really wanted to highlight in the script was just sort of like the unspoken aspect of that mm -hmm. and and the the amount of influence and power that women do and can have right well it's a scary subject matter for a lot of people right because uh, a lot of people are kind of caught up in this whole political correctness and um, I, I get it. I mean, I'm a woman. I've been sexually harassed before. I, I know what it is. It's not pretty. Um, there's, I can't say there's always a choice. Some people maybe, you know, face, you know, uglier situations than the other, than, uh, than the others. But anyway, not to be getting too deep into the subject matter, but like, um, it's always good to summon your own power and kind of like, you know, draw from it and make your choices from sure. it even if those are little 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 steps and yeah em empowering yourself but yeah. what i what i wanted to talk to you about is like well first of all it's not an easy journey being a writer <laughs> sure it's true. very true yeah and then writing scripts is not an easy journey but like not because there's a lot of like actually super creative people out there but not everyone can make the script into a movie. Yeah. And you have done that. Yeah. Uh, as an independent filmmaker, and that's right. that's amazing and writer. Um, so, um, what I want to get kind of like in depth today is, what can people do? Like people who are aspiring writers. Mm -hmm. I mean, where do they start? I mean, even like covering the software, something that they can get mm -hmm. that is maybe inexpensive or free. Yeah. You know, things like that. Yeah. I mean, my, <laughs> my advice, I've touched on this subject before and I've mm -hmm. talked about this before. And, and I think my advice is not always great necessarily because I feel pretty strongly about it. The, the first thing is make sure you're a good writer first. Like don't, I strongly urge people, at least for me and my urge as a writer was never watching movies and being like, oh, I want to make it, I want to write a script like this. It was like, I'm, I, I have certain concepts that I don't feel have been explored and I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I urge people to try to come up with something different and come up with an idea that is not what you're seeing out there all the time. From that perspective, as far as actual practical methods and things that you can do, yeah, I mean, I use a free screenwriting program called Celtics. I've always used it. I it drives my producers insane because 
I don't use Final Draft. It does, so doesn't drive compatible. me insane. <laughs> well, you're the one. Trust me. My my line producers, they lose their minds. I love this program. I've always used it, and it's it's just very intuitive for me. So, you know, as far as how I was able to get films made, I moved out to Los Angeles from Florida when I was about 23. I started doing this, and I realized right away there is no set way to do it. There's a million different ways. And you know a lot more than you think you do as far as how it needs to be done. And when you come out and you want to be a writer or be a filmmaker, it can really seem like kind of a a country club that you are not invited to, which is true in a lot of ways. But also, if you have money, you can make a film. I mean, there are basic, very basic. But did expenses. you have money? No, but I, you know, I, I raised it, and so that's the thing. It's it's really as simple. We're of a gonna matter. get to that because like everyone wants to know how. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, honestly, my tricks for fundraising are number one, make sure your script is really good. Mm-hmm. You know, don't try to get a crappy script made. Like I, 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 you know what I mean. Like make sure it's actual quality material. And honestly, there's, I could probably talk for hours about how to actually raise money, but there's different types of investors at this level of the industry. There's the unicorns, which would be like the Megan Ellisons of the world, who purely want to support the arts, and they see a great script, and they sh- say, sure, I'll give you $5 million to make your film. You, you won't find those. And if you do, please give me their number, because <laughs> I, have, I haven't found any. Yeah. The next tier are the ones who are purely interested in money and there's a lot of those and those are tricky because a film investment is inherently risky and different it's not and and it's where actually a lot of investors get really tripped up because they are usually coming from investing in real estate or other various things that that are pretty simple investing in you know startups and that kind of thing and in those industries there are a lot of rules and there are a lot of very set protocols that if you follow you generally can do pretty decently film is completely different because i see a lot of investors who go oh okay here was this independent film a quiet place right it did it's not an independent film but let's say use that as an example and it was this horror film with this concept with these actors that did great and made a bunch of money cool i'm gonna do a very similar movie with similar actors and similar music and similar shots and it's going to do just as well and then it bombs and they go well what happened because it's art and and you don't so it's tricky for those money driven investors to understand what projects are actually valuable and because of that there's been this major shift in the industry that is projects are now purely valued based on who's in them and it's a sad state of affairs because they don't care what your script is they don't care who you are and they don't, care they don't oftentimes they don't care what uh, you know the performance of the nope. talent nope they just yeah. care solely about what their numbers are mm-hmm. and so you can fight that and that's a battle to do that and say no i'm you know i want to cast spend this years actor. and years and maybe a whole life doing yeah it. yeah so my advice on that is to be respectful of those investors and understand that if you can if you can overcome using people who maybe would not have been your first choice but who help the film to get recognition and and gain some value that at some point hopefully you can become the value and then that's the dream is that you as the director people want to see your movies and then you can do whatever you want going back to the quality right exactly yeah. and and just like you know Okay, like, and even those even those directors though, still have to cast stars. Like, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson probably couldn't go to a financier or studio and say, "Look, I'm going to cast my neighbors." I mean, I guess Quaron just did it, but that was a unique, unique thing. And, you know, <laughs> neighbors, he's a, he's a god. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, but you know, that the, so there's the film investors, but then also there's another tier of investors that are very valuable, and I've actually had a lot of really good experience with. Those are the ones who are not artistically driven and not financially driven they're driven by other things they want to go to festivals yeah they want to meet the beautiful actresses they want to be able to tell their rich neighbor that they're a film investor and those are very valuable and Mm -hmm. and those people do invest and you get you know somebody who just likes you and they get 
they like your passion and they think you're a weirdo and want to want to i'm pretty sure that's why my last investor put money in my project he just liked me and he was like i don't really know what you're doing but i think it's yeah but cool. you already have kind of like a plenty of movies behind your belt so people trust your work yeah uh so the question is for, for our viewers and listeners um for example they're not even in the united states mm-hmm they're somewhere else or somewhere in the United States, but not in Los Angeles, not mm-hmm. exposed as heavily to the film industry as we are. Sure. For example, where do they begin? Like, uh, okay, so I get it. So they have to make sure that, let's say, script is really well written, mm-hmm. right? It's a yeah. great subject matter. How do they do it? I know for a fact that we, for example, sometimes send those scripts out to specific companies mm-hmm. to do the reviews. I skip all that. I don't play okay. the coverage well, game. But you let people read it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and I get gr- good coverage on my scripts regardless. But I think the answer to that question, honestly, is it depends on the project. So mm-hmm. if you you could go at it from sort of almost like a holistic way where you – for instance, like you live in Germany and you want to write a script about the sausage factory up the street from your house and you know the owner there and there's some cool characters there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know now that there's going to be a lot of costs that you can save on and you you make a movie about something that you know you're going to be able to make a movie about for a very low cost. Mm-hmm. And, and if it's good, it'll get recognized. If you are going a more traditional route and you just write a script about a subject that maybe is not that familiar to you or something like that honestly the only way the only ways that i know of to really get that film financed are crowdsourcing which is really tricky and definitely i've done it successfully but it it, again it's very star driven Mm because you have to have a lot of 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 reach for it and so honestly like i would suggest trying to find a little bit of development money for your project and Make usually it, out of pocket yeah out of pocket or i mean we're not talking much i mean a couple grand or something mm-hmm. like that to put together i guess an enticing package for an investor where they can see what the project is see what your vision is see the type of people that you're interested in getting on board and then you just have to try to go after some of those actors that will make the project even more enticing and once you've got an actor or two attached that has some value it becomes much easier to get your mm-hmm. films funded that's just the bottom line and the other thing that you just said that's interesting for people who, like you you were talking about germany for instance but it could be anywhere else for example if you have a good relationship with i don't know a restaurant mm-hmm. or some i don't know coffee chain owner or whatever uh, and you have a compelling story that doesn't take up too many locations but because that's where the money would go. Yeah. And you could try to pitch that right. to the owner yeah. and, and create the story around that particular chain. Yeah, absolutely. But before you write the script because then, right. then you're already investing a lot of your time and, mm-hmm. and the creativity and stuff. So when it's in the form of pitch, just then go and try to pitch it to those people who might be interested. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's if you can minimize locations or shoot a single location or something like that. I mean, yeah, that's not an expensive film to make, yeah, and yeah. and that's definitely one route to go. And again, yeah, like you said, that's not even that's like before you even write the script. It's when you come up with the concept, you already know you're trying to write a script for something that would be very cheap sure. to make. Yeah, and and what's what's cool about it is that, um, you know when you do one or two and you actually said that too before when you do one or two of those of those kind of little movies Mm -hmm. then um then it's easier to find investors because you already have done something right yeah i no, it's true i mean honestly like even if you make a movie and it doesn't make a ton of money but Mm -hmm. if you have actors in it that are at least recognizable to Mm -hmm. an extent that goes a long way with investors and producers because they know at the very least you can conduct yourself on set with known actors and they know you're a real director and they know you're a professional and they know that you can do it. And, you know, one thing is that we're talking as well about about writing and directing. So we're talking about filmmaking. So if you go back to just being a writer, mm-hmm. I wish I could say that... 
it was pure and that you write a great script and it's going to get recognized no matter what. That is true to an extent. If you write the most incredible script, if you write The Sixth Sense and you blindly start sending it to people, it will get recognized and it will get bought. That is true. Really? Yeah, but again, we're talking the cream of the crop. I mean, I'm talking... I, the Sixth Sense is one of the best scripts yeah, ever it's written. Yeah, it's an amazing right. script. And anyone yeah. would pick it up and go, oh yeah. my God. But with that said, that you're that's very unlikely. So more likely is you have to pitch your vision for it. You have to put visuals there for somebody to see it. And you it, that can be kind of a long road. You know, selling a script is hard. And depending on who you're pitching it to, depending on the, on your potential investors, if if for example it's uh, those are people from that the vanity pool mm-hmm. like we talked about, yeah, and and then you structure that story around whatever that that person might be interested in, yeah, right? Absolutely. Well, the vanity pool of investors that falls on you to just figure out immediately what they want and mm-hmm. and you'd be able to peg like okay, this guy, all he talks about is film festivals. So you know this guy just wants to go schmooze at the festivals, which is fun, and that's an incentive for everyone. And so you use that to an extent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're not being dishonest with someone. If you make a little film, you're going to do a festival run most likely. And you you play on that, and you figure out what their incentive is for wanting to invest in your film. And I advise you to just do that. You know, like Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't advise being... Uh, you got to toe the line. You, you you don't want an investor who is completely uninterested in your material or who dislikes your material, putting it in for mm-hmm. another reason, because you'll run into problems. But if they think your idea is cool, but the main reason they're investing is because they want their daughter to be in the movie, consider that and see whether your artistic vision can work with That's that. That's a tough one. Because imagine that daughter does not have to you know act. Again, you have to weigh that yourself and you have to determine what amount of your artistic vision works right. under those circumstances. Right. And I've been there. Yeah, Trust we me. all have. We yeah. all have. So, um, yeah. Okay, so for instance, if she's not a great, great actor or like she has zero experience, right? What I would do personally, I would first of all put her in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. And see if she's got any talent, meaning like if there's a potential. Yeah. If it's workable. You know, if not, um, well, first of all, make sure you have plenty of time to rehearse with this person. Sure. And uh, the role I would probably allocate for that kind of person would be not a lead role. Yeah. It, it completely depends. I mean, yeah. on, on my project, When the Starlight Ends, that's what happened. We, basically, my manager called me. I had Sam Hewen on board already, and he, my manager called me and said, Dr. Oz's daughter wants to play the lead. In, Are you okay to talk about it? Yeah, totally. He nice. said, All Yeah, right. and he said, Dr. Oz's daughter wants to play the lead in When the Starlight Ends. If you cast her, it'll get financed. And I'm like, who is she? I've never seen her act. He said, mm-hmm. she'll fly out here tomorrow, read with Sam, you decide and he was cool about it he's like if she sucks don't cast her she flew out she was great and she oh, read nice. with sam and sam yeah. and i loved her and i said and i asked sam and i asked the producers and i said i think she's pretty good i think she could pull this off i'm cool with casting her and they said great and then the film got financed so if she had flown out and been awful i would have said i don't think this will work but like you said i mean there are ways to kind of work with that it's hard to get a film yeah. made so i mean i would it, she, somebody would have to be a pretty high level of bad but <laughs> but also to you but you do have to be yeah. realistic with yourself yeah. and go have a longer term vision and go if i cast this person in the lead this is going to be a bad movie and you don't want to make a bad movie there's enough of them out there so like you said you can always see if they'd be willing to take a smaller role or whatever you know mm-hmm. and and that can be that can work sometimes but yeah i mean that's very much a case-by-case basis and really a personal decision and Mm -hmm. and by all means say no and if you're like no i'm not compromising my artistic vision no 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 i want this person i want this fine and i don't i i don't i don't not advocate for that but i've also been 
making movies and I know how hard it is. And so I would recommend being flexible. Yeah, I think there are some, um, you know, situations where, where you have to draw the line. Yep. But being flexible is something that you yeah. basically cannot do without yeah. and and you can comfort yourself you can comfort yourself with the knowledge that every director is spielberg scorsese cameron doesn't matter they all answer to someone even the top Until of the top of the top to. they still do that's the thing you can even comfort yourself by saying yeah guys like you know chris nolan and spielberg and that kind of thing for the most part can do whatever they want but not entirely and so they do still have to probably in much smaller measure than you still have to compromise a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and and they when they're cutting their film they still have to answer to the studio that's going to release it and so you can feel a little better knowing you know that if you're gonna have to eat a little bit of crap and put someone in a role that you don't necessarily think is perfect and maybe there would be a better actor out there you think but because you're putting this actor in there your film's getting financed that's happening at the higher levels too right. and don't feel like you are unique in that respect when you are just starting as a writer mm -hmm. do you recommend that people start with short scripts or go in a I'm, i am vehemently opposed to shorts you just in every way mm -hmm. I, I there there's zero chance of profitability on them if you're rich and want to finance it yourself for your own sort of entertainment cool do that the only ways personally that i feel a short is viable is if you're doing it as basically a marketing tool for your feature i was gonna get to that yeah so the teaser yes that is a route you can yeah. go yeah. um i it's fine if you have development money and want to use it for that my my advice with that is let's say that you have a feature concept right mm -hmm. and you've got let's say twenty five thousand dollars in development money and that's enough for you to shoot a short basically or you're going to do a 10 minute shorter version of your feature i think there's better ways to use that money and again as sad as this is it goes back to cast and i would i would recommend using that money as a deposit to get an actor on board or something mm -hmm. like that because yeah, I mean, that that, is, that could be viable if you do a teaser and an investor might see it and be like, cool, this concept is really great. But again, the industry really has changed and ideas, sadly, are a little bit less valuable right now than names. The filmmakers overseas, they, they face completely different challenges, oh, meaning sure. like not completely, sure. but but the industry often doesn't work the same way mm -hmm. over there and then people are not as familiar mm -hmm. with you know whatever we call the the, the process over here to, right. to you know to finance the movie so a lot of the times i think this is a great advice as, as opposed to making a short film because you are so you know uh, tight with finances uh, you know it's better to develop a great script and then make a, a, i don't know two three four minute teaser sure Shoot it in one location. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I know you mentioned twenty five thousand dollars. Some people, to some people, that's a fortune, right? Right. So, but there is a there's an opportunity if you if you find a camera, lights, whatever, like volunteers, a couple of actors, and you can uh, put together a compelling teaser where like you leave the audience hanging at the end, wanting for more. Mm -hmm. Then I feel like that the perfect way of present like presenting your project to the potential investors. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, a proof of concept is great. I mean, honestly, that's how that is how the Cohen brothers made Blood Simple. You know, their mm -hmm. first feature. They did a did a teaser for it. Again, my only hesitation on that, and I don't know how the film industry works overseas. I'm doing my first film this year in New Zealand that I'm producing. But it's the same as here. They're like, we want yeah, stars I was and say, we want, New you know, Zealand is not really overseas right. anymore. <laughs> that's the thing. They're like, <laughs> because... what stars can you get? And I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, you know, that's fine. But again, I, I think that, yeah, if you've got a great concept, you, again, it, it's still when you're, when you go to making the film, you're going to need a couple of names in it to really be successful and really sell it. And so 
I doing a teaser or a proof of concept or anything like that is a great idea. And honestly, maybe you use that as the tool to help get the talent on board because mm-hmm. that happens as well. And so that's, uh, but I, I would, again, my very practical, no BS advice to people. And again, this would be in America because I don't know the industry overseas very well is focus on putting a project together in all aspects that's going to be profitable. And right now, realize that outside of the studio system, which presumably you will be, the distributors and buyers and companies that are able to get your film out there right now, and this may change, hopefully it will, are looking at names and they're looking Mm -hmm. at who's in your film. And if you think with that and don't fight that and accept that, you will be more successful. Okay. And overseas... If they are more interested in concepts and visions and, and ideas, I should move overseas because I have great ideas and it's hard <laughs> yeah. to get a star on board, you know. But that's my advice, at least for here, yeah. is, is focus on that aspect of your film to an extent. Right. The one thing that I would, I would say to my fellow filmmakers, our fellow filmmakers overseas, is that because a lot of the times they um, the, look at me, I moved all the way from Kazakhstan, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of a lot of us overseas look at Hollywood, and we, we really want to come here, you know, knowing the the risk fact. Well, I don't know if I fully mm-hmm. understood the risks, sure, sure, <laughs> and, and challenges. I don't think I did, did but I. but um, so a lot of people are tr- like trying to gather their finances like trying to like move to us or from wherever in us move to la but what what i would encourage them to do instead look at your own local market sure absolutely look at your own local market and if you are capable of creating one two maybe three projects there and um you know don't be shy approach your distributors Mm -hmm. Yeah. Try to get a distribution locally, whatever sure. that means. Absolutely. And then, you know, once you have established yourself, and that oftentimes takes time, mm-hmm. which is fine, you might actually enjoy just being there. Yeah. Being a, like a filmmaker in whatever Absolutely. country you're at and or wherever region you're at. Yeah. LA is very saturated. So, I yeah. mean, honestly, if you, if you have a great story that is local to wherever you're located, people are more interested in that now than ever i mean with netflix and things like that people are watching a lot of foreign films and so i love foreign films and so i would encourage someone to stay away from la until you have to yeah until you're ready or until la is calling you and saying come to us by all means like you can gain recognition in your own you can gain recognition in hollywood by doing things locally yeah, that happened. Yeah. That happened. Uh, I could name a few names. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of the big, really the, I could almost say the biggest filmmakers in the world right now are guys like Del Toro and Cuaron and, you know, these guys are not from here. You know, me too. Like, <laughs> yeah. these are the guys winning Best Picture every year and they're Mexican and Spanish yeah. and, like, they did that. They They made their films locally with no names and they did them where they're from and then they're so good Mm -hmm. that people started and honestly like some of my favorite films recently have been out of korea and like the handmaiden and you know like there's incredible films that are coming from overseas yeah korean movies yeah Yeah, amazing amazing, yeah Mm -hmm. turkish and french and uh, german and uh, absolutely i mean any country in scandinavia it's it's, it's just great yeah so i i do want to go back to creative process but before we do that Let's kind of talk about distribution because we kind of got yeah. to that point a little bit. Yeah. So for independent films, like films with super low budget or low budget, mm-hmm. what what would you say? Like, That's tricky. I mean, honestly, I'm not an expert in distribution. I mm-hmm. will say that. I, can, I only go off of what I'm sort of told from the distributors that I know and the sales agents and that kind of thing. And that's, a, that's an interesting world. Mm-hmm. And... There are certain genres that are more that are easily more easily sellable. Uh, action, <laughs> action and horror yeah, really are thriller. the two. Yeah, yes. action, horror, thriller. But don't take that as like if you make a horror, you're going to sell it because that's not yeah. the case. There still are some pieces that have to be in place. But again, 
they come back to me and they say who's going to be in your movie and that that's a lot of films right now are being financed via pre-sale which is basically going to a distributor and saying i've got this script with this cast how much would you theoretically buy this film for and they say well we'd give you a million dollars if you have that cast and this script and you show that that cast is attached you take that letter from them and you get a loan against it or whatever and that's how films are getting made a lot Mm -hmm. of them like most of the ones i know of actually Mm -hmm. so that is a very by the numbers way to approach distribution you can make your movie and here's the thing i know a lot of filmmakers who found a rich person and got them stoked about their idea and got half a million or a million or god forbid two million or three million dollars and made a movie and didn't have any name actors in it and they're selling these movies for fifty thousand dollars if that $80,000. $80,000. Filmmaker doesn't make another movie. The investor is like, I will yeah. never go go into the industry again. And so that that's the reality of distribution right yeah. now. I mean, it's hard to get a film sold for the amount that you made it for. Mm-hmm. And so I, I ch- completely changed my paradigm before when the starlight ends. I went into it and went, forget about my movie. Forget about my script. Who's going to be in it? What, what what caliber actors do I need to guarantee us distribution? Because mm-hmm. then you're just maximizing your upside, honestly. Mm-hmm. It's like you get the right actors in it. Cool. Then at that point, you can still make an amazing film. And hopefully it's even better than you thought. And it turns out. And if, that, and if you hit that, that's when you're a successful filmmaker. When you get the right names and you make an amazing film, then the distributors are clawing at your door wanting to buy it for way more than you made it for right and again that means names wherever you are it could be the names um you know like the the, that means something for your particular market absolutely and it's your particular local distributors yes that you could work with and and with with a bit of a caveat i will say as well that the festival system is still viable with regard to a film's profitability mm-hmm. but even then you first of all it's very hard to get into the top tier festivals if you don't have stars in your movies yeah that's the truth it is hard to just make your little movie send it to sundance and pray it's right. uh, now with that said don't take that as hard advice if you're incredible and your film's incredible it'll get recognized yeah. they will watch it and they will go oh okay this film has nobody in it but it's amazing and i i've found that that happens more often with sort of like true life stories and socially relevant stories and those are the type of things that are kind of hot right now with the festival so you could theoretically make a a film about whatever human trafficking and there's no name actors in it but it's super gritty and real and well done and well shot and well made Mm -hmm. and you and yeah you get in and at that point even then getting into Sundance or getting into Cannes or getting into Toronto still is not a guarantee you're going to sell your film. They, they, you even know. if you won a prize. Yeah, exactly. That's the really thing. doesn't really guarantee and the sales. I, I, I'm not going to name, but like, I know, me too. I know incredible movies mm-hmm. that have won amazing awards. Yeah. In the, the, the best festivals of yeah. the world that yeah. essentially mean nothing. Yeah. And there's, there have been films that, that didn't have anyone in them and did well at festivals and did sell, but those are the outliers of the outliers of the outliers. And that's why I don't, I don't, I don't encourage that because Mm -hmm. it, yes, it happens, but I wouldn't aim for that aim for getting some names in your movie and doing the festival run because those movies sell for a lot. Those are the ones where you hear about the film that won at, can and it has Jake Gyllenhaal in it, right? Mm-hmm. That that's like okay, that's the movie where you made it for two million. You're selling it for ten. The, the, those are the the slam dunks, the home runs. Mm-hmm. Like you have some names that are familiar in the indie world, and you've done well at festivals. That is that is the recipe for success. Right. That really truly is. So go. My advice to any aspiring filmmaker is think casting right off the bat and think what type of actors that are recognizable that would potentially do your film 
use personal relationships, use money, use whatever you can to try to get one or two of them on board. And you can, that is your most likely way to getting, having your film be successful. Okay. And it hurt, it pains me to say that because I'm a filmmaker and I love indie film and I don't really even care all that much about mm -hmm. who's in the film that I'm watching, but I'm in the minority in that. And my dream is to be able to have a script and have people willing to give me millions of dollars to do it. I can cast whoever I want. I can do whatever I want. All of us, all of us, like we all dream about it. Yeah. Because I mean, I love our, you know, the the stars, right? Mm -hmm. They 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 stars for a reason because of the amount of talent and whatever the physical attributes they have and so on and so forth, but. I also love to see fresh faces, p discover new amazing mm -hmm. talents, and and me too. This is why I watch a lot of foreign yeah. foreign films. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's well, and he, and that again, like if you if you are not stubborn, there are ways to nurture that. For instance, like my last film. So when I went into Sargasso, which was my last movie, I knew I was going to make it for about half a million bucks, and I knew that I wanted to have a cast that would hopefully justify that type of budget. Mm -hmm. So when in talking to my producers, it was like, okay, what actors can we get that would justify this type of budget? And once I got Tom Berenger on board and Jeremy Sumter, I cast an unknown as the female lead because I knew See, that's the chance. Right. And so that that's the someone. thing. Right. Yeah. But, but, but had I gone into it as like, I want this unknown first and this is the first puzzle piece it becomes much more challenging so again that That's comes back yeah, yeah it comes back to like again i i use the cohen brothers all the time i mention them like you, you look at like you know raising arizona right which was really the film that put them on the map they had done blood simple prior to that but mm -hmm. raising arizona was kind of their their big thing and you know francis mcdormand was a little supporting role in that mm -hmm. film and they had to get a big star as holly hunter i think it was as mm -hmm. the lead and that, that's, again, the recipe to success mm -hmm. is like, yeah, I'm all about nurturing talent. And I want my actress who was in Sargasso to become a star so that my films become more valuable with her being involved in them. And I believe in her talent, so that is what it is. But, you, again, you're fighting a losing battle if you're just seeing an actor and going, I think this actor's so talented, I'm going to make them the lead in my mm -hmm. movie. Okay, do that. But realize right there you are immediately handicapping yourself drastically and realize that the caliber of talent you're going to have to put around that person is going to be higher and even just and it even can become more difficult to attach other talent mm -hmm. so the so the the sequence really should be get the big star coordinate with them regarding casting the lesser known name and let them fall in love with that person. Because mm -hmm. like, for instance, again, let's say that I had a film and it has a male and a female lead. And I have this actress that I think is incredible and she's not a name and I want to cast her. And she's got a little bit of material. Okay, I put her in, right? Now when I'm pitching the film to, or the script to big name guys, they're looking at the project and going, okay, who's gonna play the female lead? And if I'm saying, well, it's this unknown, like they're not even paying attention because like I, they don't know who she is. They, they don't know if she can act. They don't know anything. Whereas we get that name on board and we say that that role is uncast and I get my lead guy and he loves the script. He loves me, loves my vision, says, OK, I want to do it. Then I could talk to them and say, look, this is who I'm pitching. Will you take a meeting? Talk to this person. And they go, OK, yeah, sure. I can see this. I see this vision. Fine. But. That would be my advice as far as how you're going to nurture new talent or put them in smaller, smaller good roles with some nice material because then nobody cares. They're not what's selling the film. They are just really important parts of it and help mm -hmm. to build their career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to creative. When we've met, I kind of pitched you my idea mm -hmm. and you really liked it. Is that something that happens often or do you come up with your own? I know. I know you do. Yeah. But like, I want to know how. Yeah. That's 50-50. I mean, I, I'm definitely inspired by art. And, I'm inspi and I see a ton of movies and I read a lot of books and that kind of thing. But I'm not inspired in the way as far as, like I said, like I watch 
Roma and I go, oh, I want to make a black and white movie about the mm-hmm. history of Mexico. That's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I, I see a lot and I kind of osmose art and I'm my strongest drive by far as an artist is to be different and to make things that haven't been seen. And I try to come up with concepts that I haven't seen before. And so mm-hmm. that that's really my biggest goal. Like my ah, next, this is why we kind of like went on the same page yeah. was, was this project. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. like my next film, I'm shooting it in March. It's called the chariot. Mm-hmm. And it's a, I mean, it's an indie and it's, there's never been anything like it. I mean, it's weird and people acknowledge that weirdness, but that's what I want is to, take that swing at the concept that has not been done and i'm i have zero interest in i will not do a commission i won't come on board any project if to me it's just similar to and you know i just recently finally started my own production entity and and with a partner and and she and i decided i mean our, our mission statements are like no remakes no reboots no adaptations no sequels like we're not interested in doing that like any mm-hmm. any concept that we are writing you, you or directing or what? producing you don't want to mock a studio <laughs> that's the thing like i just i just i'm so tired of it i don't get like yeah, i think everyone is secretly uh, tired of it but yeah. they're not because those movies are making but what else money. are they gonna go watch because right. you know they dominate the content of theaters that's the problem though yeah, is, is so problem. stop going yeah. and watching garbage and sequels and reboots and just like every movie demand like, on something yeah. that is actually original yeah i mean my f- my favorite films of this year were the favorite you know it's a totally original concept that you were never really here completely different i mean it was based on a book fine i don't if it's an ad if it's a good ap- adaptation of a book fine you know, Hereditary it was one of the most unique horror movies I've seen in a long time. Roma mm. n- hasn't been anything like that. You know, it was very Roma's strange. on my list. It's amazing. Yeah. Mandy, you mm-hmm. know, this was incredibly bizarre mm-hmm. and unique and different. Like they are out there. You just have to stop going and seeing Black Panther and stop going and seeing A Star Is Born that's been remade eight thousand times. Seriously, <laughs> stop. Like these movies are like because I think remakes of all, remakes. Of I think remakes. people don't understand how much power they hold totally they don't understand they think yeah. okay so like i mean there's always a choice of course there's always a choice you you i mean if if you're you know a, a viewer of films you can always choose to not go yeah absolutely and you choose to see and and the type of films you go see are the type of films that hollywood will start making more of yeah and so if you support so the, you are essentially an enabler. Absolutely, you are. No, that's the thing. People complain about reboots and remakes and stuff, and then they go see them every time they come out, and they, you know, Mission Impossible Twelve, and some of these movies are fine <laughs> and they're not bad, but just realize that, you, you know, that is what you and and honestly, like the sequels thing is what drives me insane. Like that, yeah. that's what like I, I can't remember the last time I liked a sequel. I mean, maybe Terminator 2 or something like that. And that was Cameron Mm -hmm. and that was unique. But like, you know, for instance, last night I went and saw the new Spider-Man movie, which was Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And I was already leery because this is Spider-Man. It's been done a thousand times. Yeah, I was going to say. But it was incredibly different. I mean, oh, I loved it. And it was completely unique and very off the beaten path for Spider-Man, right? I guarantee you there's going to be six more of these movies. You know, next one should be Spider Woman. <laughs> the next one should not be a next one. They should just let the they fact should, that they made a good die. movie yeah, that's it. Th- be you know, enough. It's, enough is and, if, and, and yeah. now with that said, if they had a concept in from the get go that was three movies or whatever, okay, I get that. You know, that does happen, but we're talking Lord of the Rings or something. You know, like it's yes. an actual story that spans a certain number of. But films. then, then it ends. Right. But the difference is they kind of had the concept for however many movies are right. within that concept. But that's not what's happening. You're getting a lot of, we made a movie, it made a ton of money, we want to mm-hmm. capitalize more, people will see, see the sequel, let's make a sequel. And that's what's happening. And you're getting c- countless sequels. Any film that makes money is getting a sequel. I, I'm i I'm sure that, like, you know, they're going to... They, I'm not even kidding when I say that even bizarre independent ish films like you know the shape of water or something right that that blow up and become big i guarantee some execs are like how can we make a sequel to this like where's the fish land you know like i guarantee it any because 
that's the business aspect of the industry. And it's like, they want to capitalize on that. And it's, to me, it's just like, oh, it's, it's tiresome. Don't, don't you, yeah, well, I shouldn't go there, but like, <laughs> I, I kind of wish that those executives were actually truly creative. Yeah. And that's the thing. And, and again, though, they're, I, I don't blame them and I'm not even saying they're doing anything wrong. They're doing what's making their studios billions of dollars because, right. People are going to see them. But back to the ideas, the mm -hmm. original ideas. So, yeah. for example, me, I am always, and I self-analyze all the time, right? So, mm -hmm. me kind too. of like, yeah. yeah. And so I found out about myself that I'm very much, um, you know, the subject matters of like social injustice, any kind of social injustice, whether, whether it's like misogynism mm -hmm. or anything. You know, that drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. And and like the latest movie my company made mm -hmm. was kind of about that. The movie yeah. that we're making mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, about that. But it's more on the empowering side of sure. things, you know. So, sure. um, and no, 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 guys. I'm not just interested in women's subject matters. <laughs> no, I understand what you're saying. Socially <laughs> yeah. relevant. Sure. I think justice should be for all. Sure. It doesn't matter. Like, yeah what your background is, gender, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, so I guess what I'm saying is, is like a lot of the times creative people should find those kind of like really, you know, important things about themselves mm -hmm. and use it as a source for their creativity yeah. because that's where like a lot of energy going to come out. Sure. Yeah. Wherever you come, wherever you have that, I mean, and that's great that that is your, your, sort of impetus and toward I think a lot my of your childhood projects. kind of like yeah <laughs> no totally that. yeah I I am personally I'm I'm very far from that I don't mm -hmm. care about social matters mm -hmm. I'm yeah, tired of I'm tired of hearing about them I'm tired of people pontificating about them I'm I'm more of a sci-fi guy really at my heart and so I'm interested in concepts that are intellectual and spiritual and address some of the bigger questions that are not like racial or sexual or gender any i don't i truly i'm so tired yeah, of, and there's all, some great stuff but let me tell you something all of that kind of goes together because like i, I grew so up reading sci-fi but yeah. it's, it's just like a given i love it yeah, yeah. not everyone does but like sure. I do. but like the spiritual aspect of things mm -hmm. it's 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 such a fuel for me yeah you know yeah. um yeah so and honestly uh, you're go more toward your side no, because right saying, now like for whoever no, it is right that, i'm saying people who are listening or watching yeah. or whatever they do think about social matters because right now those are very hot and that is what hollywood wants my next film i'm doing is about reincarnation this is not a social matter it's, it's a purely yeah, but, like strange but this is thing. something that's also very important meaning like because people sure. are rediscovering their you know spiritual paths and, that intrigues me yeah that yeah. that aspect i will not make a film about racial injustice even the one that you and i are doing you know cry on command it's, it's which is about it is and what drew me to that was that was a, a particular social subject that i've always just been so amused by and and you you know my first few drafts were wild i mean and they had things in them that were very out there and different and very sci-fi exactly <laughs> right and it had to be reined in a little bit but but that that's honestly a little like off type for the type of stuff I usually do. And I get pitched tons yeah, of Yeah, but it's a brilliant script. No, it is. Oh, yeah. it, I love it. And it's going to be an amazing film. And it it's great. And so I'm not saying like I won't touch anything that has a social. Because I, you know, I see the problems out there. I'm not blind. I'm very aware of them. I just think that, that uh, and I guess honestly, what it is is I'm, I don't want to be Michael Moore. But I think that uh, in our project, um, the difference is we're not hitting people in the head. No, because there's like two ways of approaching yeah. social injustice kind of absolutely things. Like you either literally bring the ugliness and you shove it up to people's like faces and mm -hmm. you like make them see it yeah. or you do show it but in a way that empowers them yeah and it, honestly for me it's most what's most important is the story that's it i mm -hmm. i don't like if you want to tell an amazing story and it has a social aspect to it yeah do that don't go 
into it necessarily as like I want to change this aspect of society because I feel like all of your decisions then are just going to be so one-sided and so focused on that that you're not going to really affect change in people who are again already ingrained to feel a certain way whereas Mm -hmm. if you go at it from the perspective of like I want to tell this amazing story and it has this aspect to it because that's what cry on command is like I wanted to just stand back and not judge any of the characters in the script they That's do what exactly they what do yeah. right they do yeah. what they do you can observe it and feel a certain way and i'm hopeful that people would come out of it feeling differently and some people would say i think this character was right and someone say i think this character is right and then invoke discussion from that perspective rather than i didn't set you know with that one with a very specific this is the way i want people to feel about this project yeah you don't want to be right in the middle i mean you don't want to go with safe choices sometimes right. because like if if you do it's almost guaranteed that it's just going to be a very mediocre movie yeah so you take a risk yeah. and you stand uh, w- with whatever you believe in and then yeah. and then see what happens and yeah. some will hate yeah you and your movie <laughs> and, true. and some will love you and yeah. your movie totally no yeah. you put it you you set it on the head I, personally as a filmmaker i would much rather just evoke a strong emotion i don't care what it is right mm-hmm. rather than have people be like yeah it's pretty good right. i don't want that ever that is like the ultimate no for me i would rather a hundred people hate it and five be like it's the best thing i've ever seen than 105 people all be like yeah it's cool <laughs> i yeah. thought it was decent sure. i don't want that it's not my interest at all but would... you know it's pretty horrifying i remember in the premiere of, of uh, our latest film i uh, i was waiting for the q a and when the tiles went up on the screen a portion of like the audience got up and they they knew who i was they were passing me by with hatred in their eyes And then the other portion of people got up and gave me a standing ovation. Mm. It's just so it was a success. I mean, that yeah, (laughs) in my opinion, I would I would much rather that than you know a little bit of this and then they're checking their phones and yeah, moved on to the next (laughs) thing. No, I I think you succeeded then. Yeah. So that that's the other advice. Don't take safe uh, choices. Absolutely, I feel very strongly about that. I I would strongly advise personally so because if i ever have to watch your movie whoever you are i want it to be different and if you're making you know a similar movie to a movie i saw last year first of all i'm not even going to see it to begin with but you know come on like do something that i haven't seen before that's really the biggest advice i have to anyone that's wanting to start out i strongly encourage people to do exactly what you said don't make safe choices make some safe choices make safe choices with regard to your cast and make safe choices with regard to your production, but for your script and the creative aspect of it. No, I think go as wild and off the beaten path as possible. I mean, for instance, like I I wrote a script recently. It's a big science fiction script and it's, it's, it, the script itself is pretty unique and it's out there, but there's one section of it in particular. It's about a, uh, about an eight page arc that is, pure insanity like not like nothing you've ever seen before <laughs> yeah. and i so this script has gone to studios and gone to aaa list actors and i when i was initially sort of pitching it and it was going out i kind of was like i wonder how many people are going to say like this is a great script but you got to get rid of the weird section like what where the hell did that come from why is it there to unanimously people think it's their favorite part so people are open to things they haven't seen before people i feel like are almost more afraid to write them or don't necessarily have the capacity or the interest Mm -hmm. in doing that and so but it will be well received or received in a manner that is not indifferent exactly yeah Yeah, and you'll get you'll get the the one thing you don't want you don't want indifference yeah and that that comes yeah exactly and so when you're going to investors as well you may get passed on more Mm -hmm. but the one who does it loves it and they're very passionate about it and you will be much happier in the long run because they will be much easier to deal with so well yeah. this was amazing thank you so much adam of course it was a this great was conversation so much fun. and a lot yeah. of practical advice yeah hopefully so, yeah 
yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, I'll see you in a little bit. I'll see you very soon. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.